This is the Overtime Podcast Network. You're listening to Building the Broncos with Nick Kendall and Carl Dummler, Broncos Country's leading draft and scouting analysts. Get on over to milehighhuddle.com to sound off on all things Broncos. Hello there, Broncos country, and it is once again time for another episode of Building the Broncos. I'm your host, Carl Dummler, and with me as always, we have my co-host and good friend, Mr. Nick Kendall. Nick, I think this is what I love about, about the NFL is the offseason is still one of the busiest times of the entire year. I mean, uh, we, we get to this this part of the season, and and you and I especially get excited, and I hope our fans that are listening get excited. But, uh, I mean, we got news of coaches coming out. We're going to have news of Senior Bowl, which is in like two weeks. That's crazy. Uh, we got e- East-West Shrine Bowl. Is it next week? Is that right? Yes, it is, and I am excited for that. Oh, man. And so, I mean, there's just so much thing, so many things going on with the NFL and, and the Broncos especially, and I'm just excited to get talking about all this. What about you, man? I'm ready to get forward. I am really happy that the coaching hire has been settled. I don't really have strong opinions on the hire itself. I do have some strong opinions on stuff surrounding the hire, which we'll get to here soon. But, yeah, it's – I mean – the off season, especially I mean, everything after the draft is dead season. Now that's the worst from the draft to when preseason game one starts, that kind of stinks. But other than that, I mean, this is, this is fun time. We got playoffs going now. And even though the Broncos are out of the playoffs, I mean, well out of the playoffs, obviously there's a lot of differing opinions going on, a lot of news coming out and just a lot of structuring the roster going forward, which, you know, you and I love enough that we started a podcast and it's gotten us to, to this point and it's been growing ever since we started. So yeah, we absolutely love it. I mean, some of you listeners out there, I, I would literally play Madden and I wouldn't play any of the games. I would just sim the games, but work as the general manager, signing guys, drafting guys, training guys, trading guys, et cetera, et cetera. So absolutely love the roster building aspect of it. And uh, this is a, a pretty empty pallet here in Denver. So we're going to have to do a lot of reshaping and whatnot, but that's, that's what we're here for this off season. Exactly. That's what the building the Broncos podcast is all about. It's focusing on all things pertain to your Denver Broncos, especially as it relates to the NFL draft. And like we just said, team building with Nick and myself being armchair GMs, we'll be bringing you fresh insight and analysis each and every week in every single episode. We'll be doing scouting the enemy, player value, scheme, and personnel fits, and of course, just some football-related banter. You can follow myself on Twitter at Carl Dumbler MHH, as well as follow Nick at Nick Kindle MHH. And be sure to tweet us any questions or opinions you have, because we live for talking Bronco football. You can also follow the podcast Twitter account at HuddleUpPod. Make sure you check out ours and our co-writers' written content at MileHighHuddle.com, a part of the 24-7 Sports and an affiliate of the CBS Sports Digital Network. We know you listeners are as football draft and Bronco crazy as we are. So please give us a click and subscribe to us on iTunes as well as Stitcher. And don't forget to share us on Facebook and Twitter. We wouldn't be here today without your listeners. So as a call to action, please go and take the time to go to iTunes or Spreaker and rate and subscribe and let your voices be heard on how you enjoy our show. Now, before we get going, we first want to say thank you to our great sponsor, Audible. You get a free audiobook download and 30 day free trial at www.audibletrial.com backslash huddle up. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Again, that's www.audibletrial.com backslash huddle up. Well, Nick, let's just get into this because, uh, I mean, we're, we're recording this, what, about two hours after the official announcement of the head coach? Yeah, about two hours has gone by and a lot of differing opinions. Now, We'll see what happens as it goes forward, but officially Vic Fangio announced as the head coach of the Denver Broncos after a, gosh, what seems like a coaching search that lasted forever. But I mean, at least we're not the the Jets or the Dolphins still looking for a head coach. So yeah, <laughs> it's not yeah. it's not as exciting as a John Harbaugh would have been or a young offensive mind. But I, I get the hire. There's a lot of interesting stuff though. I mean, it's rumor season. It's I don't have a direct tie to John Elway. We got some connections in Dove Valley. But, you know, we'll, we'll talk about some of this stuff and just just some of the rumors, you know, whether they're 100 percent true or not. You know, that's that's the hot stove season. A lot of garbage out there as well. So who knows? But it's a, it's an interesting hire. I'm just glad that we can start filling out this staff and going forward with the uh, reshaping of the roster. Right. I mean, it's you're right. This isn't the absolute exciting hire that some people have, have like last year every or two years ago. Everybody was all about Kyle Shanahan. He was going to be the big uh 
famous name, obviously in Denver, Shanahan is synonymous with championships and, and everything good that is the Broncos. But uh, Vic Fangio, I mean, this is a guy that he's been around the league for a long, long time. And I mean, is that a concern for you that he's been around for so long and yet has never been a head coach? That is a little bit of a concern for me. I think that the biggest concern here is that in his interviews, you know, again, this is pure hearsay. I'm not in the interview, so, you know, I can't stand for this exactly. But some reports are that he's rubbed some people the wrong way. He's kind of an off-cuff guy. He's a little bit rough around the edges. And a lot of these owners, you know, they want a guy that not only can coach the team, but can be a face as well and be good with PR. And that really hasn't been Fangio's MO. Now, granted, is Bill Belichick the best, you know, smiles, put kissing babies type of guy and helping out the media and whatnot. No. So you don't need that, but I think that's an important part for, for owners at least and teams looking to hire a head coach. So that's one reason I think he hasn't been hired for a while. And I think he's another guy that's just been a fantastic defensive coordinator. They haven't really seen him as the, the CEO type, but rather the, the micromanager scheme type. And that doesn't always work at head coach. So it'll be interesting. It's going to change things in Denver, obviously. But it, it's it is slightly concerning that he hasn't been given a head coaching gig yet. I, I always think of Mike Zimmer. Mm. He was another guy that really rubbed people the wrong way. He's he was very, from what I understand, was very blunt. He didn't hold back. He didn't try to sugarcoat or make it sound good. He just said what was on his mind, and that rubbed a lot of GMs or owners the wrong way. And I mean, Mike Zimmer has been doing pretty good there, and with the Vikings, obviously. And obviously was a great defensive coordinator for the Bengals when they were having at least making the playoffs, not getting much further than that, obviously. But uh, I mean, it's I, I guess it is a little bit of a concern, but I, I've I've wanted Vic Vangio for a long time. He when we when they announced their five who they were going to interview guys, he was at the top of my list just because mm-hmm. I loved when he was with the, the 49ers. I loved his defense. Yeah, I loved how aggressive they were. They were flying downhill. They were just beating people up. And then he uh, – in Chicago, that's been the same thing this year, just beating people up. And I don't think you can really blame the defense a whole lot for that loss this last Sunday. I mean, you hold the team to 16 points. Don't you kind of expect to win? Yeah, that's – I mean, could they have been better down the stretch? They didn't – they broke at the end, you know, Ben don't break. We've been talking a lot about that with the Broncos defense. They broke at the end of the game and Nick Foles magic continues. So that's something to, to watch also going forward. We'll talk about that here, but yeah, no, he's uh can't really blame him for this, for that loss. And obviously if your kicker missed that and the offense is kind of mediocre and the offensive line is getting beat like they were, but he definitely is. I mean, he's still part of the coaching staff. So there's, there's a, he definitely harbors some of the blame for the loss, but I wouldn't put the, put it on him by any means. Right, right. But uh, I, I, the only the, my biggest concern in all of these head coach searches was who was going to be on their staff. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I think that gets to be such an underrated part. You get so focused on the head coach that you kind of forget that the coordinators almost played just as big of a role. I mean, look at Mike McCoy, offensive coordinator here, ended up getting fired. And he just he never was a good fit. He never understood what he was doing and and obviously got fired. And for the Broncos, that's been an issue here in the past of just not finding great coordinators to to work with the, the head coach. Uh, Wade Phillips is about the only good def- coordinator that I can think of here in the last few hires, wouldn't you say? Yeah, but something that sticks out to me, I believe I heard it in the Moving the Sticks podcast with Bucky Brooks and Daniel Jeremiah, which you know, they're not a sponsor of the pod or anything, but if you like football podcasts, that's one of the better ones out there, I think. But the quote, I think it was Bucky Brooks that said it, and it stuck with me. You know what makes good coordinators? Good players. So, obviously, Wade <laughs> Phillips, he's been up and down, but that defense, I mean, he hit the defense around him, the talent around him, was great you know was bill musgrave system great for the broncos especially for keenum no it was not but was kubiak system great with manning in 2015 no it was not <laughs> so that there's a uh, good players make good coordinators i think so it's, right. it's important to get these coordinators right but i think it's it's more important to get the get talent on this roster going forward but yeah yeah so uh, l- let me break this down on this question 
who are the players that benefit the most from this hire and who are the players who are hurt the most by this hire? I think that the guys who are benefit the most from this hire probably are the the defensive front and the pass rushers. I really doubt that we're going to be seeing Bradley Chubb and Von Miller dropping into coverage like we've seen them do over the past few seasons. Granted, does that mean their snap total goes down? Because in situations where they're asked to be in coverage, they're going to be not on the field. I, I don't know. That remains to be seen. But I think that this really does change the back seven a lot. Fangio has been a guy who's been implementing more zone coverage where Denver has been. I mean, they've been teetering more towards zone over the past few years, but it's, I think there's going to see a massive change there as far as uh, what they're asked to do as far as the cornerbacks, the coverage. And we have been getting guys that are more man oriented. So again, like a guy like Bradley Roby, I don't think he makes sense for the Fangio defense. He's much better in a man scheme. He doesn't have that fluidity, patience, instincts, whatever you want to call it for that zone defense. And I don't, I mean, Chris Harris Jr., another guy, he doesn't have massive length. And that's something that Fangio likes on the outside. I mean, even if you have guys that are a little bit less talented, you know, he prefers to have that length and ability to come downhill where Chris Harris Jr. is, I think, is a little bit better in a man's game. But we'll see. But the biggest change is going to be the linebacking core, obviously. I mean, from Sam Fangio with San Francisco having guys like Patrick Willis and Navarro Bowman to spending, I mean, an eighth overall pick this past season with the Bears and getting... Uh, Roquan Smith and having Danny Trevathan, you know, run around there. This is a scheme that it's very different than what we've seen for the Broncos over the past few years, where the Broncos have been looking to kind of get bargains and can just fill in guys at the linebacking position. Bangio's system is very dependent on talent, athleticism, and speed at the linebacking position for covering the middle of the field. And he'll keep those guys out there because they have to be able to do that. So it's going to be a change in philosophy for the Broncos, which will be interesting to see. But he's been successful where he's gone defensively. This will be his first head coaching stint, so we'll we'll see what that brings to the table as far as uh, what that means. If the defense is going to be under his eye, if they're going to bring in a defense coordinator that gets more play calling, et cetera, et cetera, more details will come out. But I think the biggest change, I mean, obviously, it's got to be linebacker. Right. No, I'm with you there, and, and I agree. The pass rusher is going to have a have a wonderful time with this guy. I think they're going to love the aggressive style that this defense brings and wanting to get after the quarterback. And and I think some of our guys in, se- in the secondary are going to really love this, and this is going to be a turnover central. I mean, that's one thing that his his defenses have always been known for is is forcing a lot of turnovers. So I could see Justin Simmons having a lot more big numbers that, that attract teams. Uh, you just wrote an article on Landon Collins. Comes yes, to the Broncos, and he is a big turnover machine there for the Giants. When healthy, when healthy, yes. <laughs> Sorry, I should add that <laughs> in there. distinction, right? But and and I do agree with you. I, I don't think Bradley Roby is now a fit. I was going to write an article on why I thought the Broncos maybe should think about keeping Bradley Roby, mostly just because the cornerback market is just <laughs> it's pretty bare for free agents. Honestly, uh, there, there's it's some great. Dec- it, there's some decent names, but there's nothing that just stands out of oh, you got to go get this guy. I hope that they can find a former kind of highly thought of player that can come in and it clicks for them because honestly, that's what the bears did. You know, they got a fuller who had a solid season that had been up and down. And then this year, first team, all pro. Right. And on the other side, they got Prince of Mukamura first former first round pick never really lived up to that standard. And then this season, bingo, bingo playing great ball. So that's what the hope is. But I think that a lot of their success is more, it's more dependent on the talent up front. You know, they got a lot of talent. (laughs) Obviously the safeties are really talented. The linebackers, a lot of speed, but I would say that what makes that defense, what made the defense click for the bears was obviously having a Cleo Mack, a top three level edge rusher. And then the guy that I don't know why he doesn't get more hype, but Akeem Hicks. And from that, everything else flourishes. That's when I, when I watch Quinn and Williams, that's kind of the picture I get is Hicks that, that disruptor, the big guy in the middle that just can destroy people. <laughs> it's, yeah. uh, it's, it's fun to watch for sure. But uh, no, I, I agree. It's going to be, it's going to be interesting to see how this defense adjusts and what players get to stay, which ones don't. Uh, this could maybe mean, cause I know there, there was news that Brandon Marshall would be willing to rework his contract. He is probably the most athletic linebacker that we have i don't know it's kind of hard to tell with his injuries anymore what he really is yeah i think that that's a nice gesture that he might rework his contract and obviously working with a guy who really likes his linebackers that might be exciting but uh, i can't see them 
sticking with Marshall given his contract injury history. Granted, Josie Jewell and Todd Davis really do not fit the Fangio linebacking mold. So right. who knows? It's going to be, there's going to be, have to be turnover there. There's going to have to be some compromise year one. And I expect them, we'll talk about it in the future, probably not today, but I expect them to hit free agency hard because there actually are some linebackers of quality that are set to hit free agency. You know, will they, some teams might retain their guys, but that's, that's something I'm very interested in. Right. Yeah. That, that's going to be an area I expect them to be willing to spend some big money at this, this off season. Or some, uh, it's hard to say draft capital because we don't know who's going to enter the draft yet at that position. Yeah, there are, there are three guys that I have on the top of my board, and all three might not come out. <laughs> so that'll that'll change things drastically. Right. It, it could be have to wait on that position until next year kind of mentality. Yeah. But, uh, and then the other big news we've been hearing is that Gary Kubiak is going to be the offensive coordinator. I've, I've heard countering points on that. Is that right? That's what it sounds like right now. It might not be that it is his official title. Mike Kliss has tweeted that that out and at least hinted at it. So I, I would assume that's going to be the case. But even if they bring in somebody else with the title of offensive coordinator, from everything I'm gathering, that's only in title, whereas the power scheming, the design of the offense is Kubiak's. So even if he's not given the offensive coordinator title, which, again, it sounds like he will be you know, at the time we're recording this, it's Kubiak, the offensive coordinator. And uh, I'm, I'm torn on that, I guess. Yeah. I, I mean, Kubiak schemes, it, we, we've seen Kyle Shanahan runs very similar schemes, obviously. He has some nuances that Gary Kubiak doesn't do that I hope Gary Kubiak now will say, okay, let's watch Kyle Shanahan and see what he's doing to make this system more of today's NFL. Uh, even, even Sean McVay runs some of that, that zone scheme. So, I mean, I'm, I'm hoping that he's watching those guys and saying, okay, let's see how they've melded the young quarterbacks with today's NFL with my old system. It, I hate it, to be this guy, but I think Sean McVay is a little overrated, but can continue. Everybody <laughs> loves them, but like they use like the least amount of personnel packages in the entire NFL this year. And if it works, it works. But I mean, there's pretty much strictly an 11 personnel team running everything off this zone stretch. I, I've seen it in, the university of Iowa for years, obviously the pass game is much more nuanced as far as vertical passing. Granted, they have athletes on the outside that Iowa will never have. Duh. But (laughs) I just, I I really like Sean McVay, but again, I think it's, it's as much the players as it is the coach. So, and and I'm with you there. I mean, I I think he was a huge hire for Jared Goff. Yeah. But at the same time, Jared Goff was a very talented quarterback. There's a reason that he was first overall. Yeah, I was going to say first overall is pretty I mean, that means something. <laughs> right, exactly. Then they they had a great running back already that they had drafted. Offensive line, they were willing to spend money there. I mean, they have put that offense together with money, with draft picks. They've they've put a lot into that to make it work. And, I mean, and, and it's working, obviously. They're, they're a great team. Don't want to take anything away from them. But I'm kind of with you a little bit. I think McVay's getting a little overhyped. It's kind of funny watching all the memes now of, um, oh, you met – Sean McVay at a party once head coach, here you go. <laughs> and, and it's kind of being that way a little bit. Everybody's going, we got to find the next Sean McVay. And uh, honestly, for me, I think Doug Peterson's done more. I have been, give me the Andy Reed coaching tree. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't think Eric Benimi's ready yet, but I mean, you got the Doug Peterson, you got the Reich, you got the Nagy. I mean, that's, that is where it looks pretty promising. And speaking yeah. of people like going way too hard one way, Cliff Kingsbury for Arizona. Are oh you serious? God. A guy that picked Davis Webb over Baker Mayfield and couldn't win football games with Patrick Mahomes. <laughs> I, I just, I don't, I mean, I get that you're looking for that guy. And now the NFC West probably has the best looking head coaches in the NFL with Sean McVay and Kyle <laughs> Shanahan. So, but other other than that, I mean, we keep saying it on here. Josh Rosen is going to get David Card, and I really <laughs> looking more and more that way. We'll see; it might change, but it'll be a it'll I, be I interesting. I don't like that pairing with Josh Rosen. I I, I don't just don't it. think that's a good fit. That's not his style of play. Yeah, we'll see. He's going to have to adapt. But I mean, going from being fired at Texas Tech for not getting it done to now the head coach of an NFL team, I don't <laughs> disrespect the hustle at all. But like. How did we get here? <laughs> I, I don't know. So. Oh, man. It's it's fun. Like I said, this is a crazy time of year. Everything yeah. is just up in the air. And and it's always hard. Going from coordinator to head coach, I think, is one of the biggest changes 
that any coach can go through. Because, I mean, when you're going from we're focusing on X's and O's and designing plays and I only have 30 players that I'm working with or so to now I'm in charge of an entire organization. I'm not so much the X's and O's guys, but I'm the the manager. I'm the overseer. There's just so many different nuances compared to I, – I think this is why people get so wrapped up in, oh, they were a great coordinator. That means they're going to be a great head coach. I don't think you can ever really make that correlation. That's not how that works. It's a different job. Coordinators and play calling, scheming, whatnot, where the head coach, in theory, needs to be more big picture, making sure everyone else is doing their job, the CEO type. So we will see. Right. But, yeah, no, we should talk a little bit more about – so my my biggest grievances, I'm going to layer – what an airing of the grievances with this hiring. It's not Fangio. That's not my issue. I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt. But – my biggest thing is that there's it's a three things. One, the talk about the philosophy going forward with this team. It sounds like what they're trying to do is trying to replicate the 2015 team. And I am sorry we've talked about that that on here multiple times. I think I mean as grateful as I am about the the 2015 team obviously. I think that 2012 team is better and if you were trying to replicate an all-time defense as your plan of success. I mean, okay. My plan is I'm going to draft Tom Brady in the sixth round, you know, like, okay, okay, good luck. Jennifer Lawrence, you know, the little sarcastic thumbs up (laughs) gift. That's, that's where I'm at with that. There's a reason it's all time. It has to, everything has to come together at the same time. And I just, I don't think that's a a reasonable plan. And I get that Fangio has been great on defense. Broncos got Bradley Chubb and Von Miller are their most important players going forward on this team and most valuable for sure. And you have that, principle in there but i just i think you're trying to reach back for something that was an isolated incident there's a reason it's called an all-time defense and furthermore trying to have an all-time defense is much more of a a short window you know you had denver had how many years did they have a super bowl elite level defense one and a half to two maybe Mm, yeah maybe i mean they had a lot of the pieces in 2016 yeah, the offense didn't hold their end of the bargain. Right. But it wasn't enough to overcome that offense. You know, right. like 2015's and, defense was enough to overcome the offense. And I'd say 2014, they had pretty much all those pieces. They just had a terrible defensive coordinator in, in Del Rio that yep. didn't know how to use it. Well, I think he got lazy. That's my biggest grievance against Del Rio. He got all this talent put in his lap and he just said, all right, we're just going to play base defense and our players will just be better than your players yeah. and while that's i mean against weaker opponents that's okay but against the better teams you have to scheme to beat them yeah, yeah. i mean you look at at the patriots with belichick he is one of the all-time schemers he knows how to take away your your strengths and make you have to beat them with their with your weaknesses and uh, <laughs> Del Rio just never even thought about doing something like that. Mm-hmm. Oh, they're beating us with this one play over and over again. Let's just keep running the same defense. Oh, sorry. I, I'm I'm still very bitter about that 2014 team because, again, that, that was, to me, 2012 and 2014 were that mashup of great defense with a prime Peyton Manning. I mean, yeah. the end of 2014, he was starting to lose it a little bit but it was still somewhat there and just they they were opportunities that were very much blown. Yeah. I can't disagree. So back to the area of the grievances, Uh, the number two for me is that this is from Mike Florio. So is it true? This guy, you know, sometimes it's hot wind coming out of his mouth and maybe out of his back end as well. But he said that Fangio essentially knelt down and told Elway that, you know, I, if you give me this position, you can pick the staff I just want to be a head coach. And that's, you know, there's some questions about that given what we've heard about Fangio's personality. But if that's the case, that has me very concerned because I feel like a lot of issues with this team, as far as coaching concerns go, is that OA has been too meddling. You know, that's, and the fact that we have a head coach that's coming in that's potentially not going to be picking his own coaches, that alarm bells were ringing off just throughout the entire building that I was in when I heard that. And then finally, my third issue was the Kubiak offense, which 
I'm sorry. I still haven't forgiven him. I know he's been a solid person in Denver and he has a lot of fans, but I, it's going to take me a little bit longer to forgive him for making Manning play pistol. I mean, that was something I don't think I'd, I'd ever see. And he was so staunch about having that running back line up behind the quarterback for the run game that he made an all time quarterback, even though he was a shell of himself, an all time quarterback have to play pistol. That was the compromise. So, man, that that was an ugly season. That was such a weird season on offense. Gosh, the Osweiler times as well. I don't even know. Oh, yeah. So How I'm a little bit Super Bowl. I, I still How? I'm still trying to figure some of that out. I mean, I know we had an all time defense, but there were just games where, I mean, the defense had to outscore the other, the opponent's offense. Honestly. Yep. I mean, literally, that was a magical season. I don't want to compare it to the the Ravens' magical season with Ray Lewis, but like the Broncos were a couple bounces away from not getting the one seed, and they ended up with the one seed, and that made a world of difference. And then Antonio Brown doesn't play in the playoff game that comes down to you know the last five minutes against the Steelers, and then the Broncos are able to get the lead early on and dictate the flow of the game versus both the Patriots and the Panthers. So, I mean, that's that's just the way the ball rolls sometimes, and Mm -hmm. all it takes is that one game. But like we've said on here a hundred times, if you're going – if I'm matching up the 2015 Broncos to the 2012 Broncos, I'm taking the 2012 team every time. Yeah. So that's – it'll be interesting to follow that. Yeah. Now, on that note, here are some things that I do love about the Fangio hiring. One of the things that he has been great at doing is stopping some of the high-powered offenses in the NFL. He is one of the, the few guys that has really shown well the, the Rams game. Held him to six points. I still don't even know how that happened. Beat him 15 to six just a, a little over a month ago. It was pretty cold that game too, right? I think it was. I mean, yeah. I'm sure that played into some of it, but it's still a, a team that's up there averaging around 30 points per game and yeah. you hold him to six points. That's, that's pretty impressive. Tell the tape will be how the Rams do against the Cowboys this week. We'll get to that later too, but that's, I'm, I'm very interested in that game. I think the Rams are a little bit overrated. Yeah. I I can't disagree. Yeah. Yeah. I can't disagree completely, but you think about having Mahomes and the chiefs in the division. uh, uh, The, the chargers obviously have had a pretty high powered offense as well. So having a, a defensive coordinator slash head coach, that can actually scheme and stop some of those things. And, and again, I mean, the Bears have a lot more talent than the Broncos do right now. The, there's no getting around that. They have, I mean, you, you already said it, the, the secondary. They have some great pieces in that secondary that fit that defense very well. They have athleticism at the linebacker position, and then they've, they have pass rushers up front and guys that can stop the run. So, I mean, they have every piece possible, and the Broncos are not there. But there's still some of that where he's shown throughout – his coaching history that he can really put a defense together. He knows how to do that. So that is one thing I'm excited about with the the Fangio hiring. I am also a big fan of the fact that he is kind of a, a no nonsense kind of guy. Yeah. I think the Broncos need that right now. He's not a player's coach. His players are sad to see him leaving because obviously he's been a good coach there. But as far as the a guy that you want to have drinks with, you know, after work or something, that's, <laughs> that's not this boss. Right. And like I said, I I think that's exactly what the Broncos need right now. I'm not sure if he is a Super Bowl winning kind of head coach. This kind of reminds me a little bit back in 2011 when the Broncos brought in John Fox. That's not an exciting hiring, but he is a guy that helped to kind of quiet the chaos at 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 the organization and kind of brought the players back together, got them where they needed to go and 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 got them on track. And you've even heard a lot of the veterans talk about that, of needing a veteran coach to come in. I think that was part of it with VJs. He just lost the locker room. Players really just didn't like him. We've heard some things where some players went into John Elway and said, either this guy's gone or trade me or cut me or whatever. And, and so when you start having that, especially some of the leaders in the locker room telling you, hey, this coach is not good. That's not a great thing to have. And for me, Fangio, one, I think players would be afraid to go behind his back. I mean, you look at this guy and you're scared of him. (laughs) Yeah, I'm afraid to uh, (laughs) get in a dark room with him. I feel like they need to just do it or as a Broncos PR kind of stunt, have the uh, 
the Godfather scene when he's coming in to ask a favor, you know, petting the cat in there and like <laughs> <laughs> if he if he comes into that press conference with a cat, he oh is my, my all time favorite head coach. <laughs> I'm just gonna say that right now. I don't care how he does as a head coach, I don't care if we lose a bunch of games, that will be an all time moment in football. Yes. <laughs> I disagree. But uh no, I mean it, I'm I'm gonna reserve judgment right now. I I'm not I'm not overly excited. I'm not overly in panic mode either at this time with this yeah. head coach hiring. I'm just kind of a, well, we'll just see what happens. I, I don't know. Like I said, with head coaches, it's just so hard, especially when this is his first time being head coach to know how good or bad he's going to do at that kind of job. I can't disagree. All right. Well, time to prop one last little tidbit here that I've been picking up about this hiring is that from what I understand, Joe Ellis the committee and people in the Broncos organization, they were leaning Mike Munchak guy with a proven track record, good offensive line coach. And Elway was deliberating back and forth between Fangio and Munchak. In the end, Elway went with his gut and his heart and decided to go with Fangio, not listen to the committee and make it his hiring. This is a double edged sword. If he gets it right, He's the hero. You know, he's the guy who trusted his gut. He's the genius. He pulled it off. If he gets it wrong, always going down with the ship. I don't think there's any other way around it. So we will see how this works out in the end. I honestly, I don't mind the Fangio hiring at all. I don't really have a strong love for it either. I didn't, you know, same with Munchak. Some of the stuff around it, like I've said, concerning there. But this is, this is purely an Elway hire. And no matter the outcome, it's on him. So this this could be, if it goes wrong, this could be the end of LA in Denver. And I, you know, I hate to, not to hate, but I hate to promote another podcast. But I heard Ryan Konensberg say this on the, the BSN podcast. He said that LA, you know, it's a classic quote from a great movie. You either die the hero or live long enough to see yourself become the villain. And if LA gets this wrong, this, uh, it might be it. And he's still a legend in Denver, but again, that Quote really applies. So we well, will I mean, see that. Big. You, you think about it. Elway has three years left on his contract. Yeah. And that's about the time, about two years in is when you kind of know what kind of head coach you have. I mean, we just saw it with, with VJ getting fired after two years. I mean, that's kind of the window that he has to get things going here in Denver. And it could be just about lining up with when the Broncos say, Hey, Elway, thanks for all you've done, but we need something else. Yep. So I don't know. It's uh, yeah, he's definitely made sure that if he's going to go out, he's going to go out his way. Yeah, that's for sure. And I just think it's really interesting that he went against at least reports are he went against the committee. So <laughs> we'll be, we'll be very interesting. I'm obviously still going to pull for this team, but got to cover them as unbiased as possible one way or the other. So we'll see how it plays out, but color me just, just a tad skeptical about this, the whole thing. So we will see. Uh, but now, you know, talking about get a little bit about some other stuff, we got to turn our attention quickly to the college football championship game. And man, Carl, I'm glad I did not bet on this game because I would have lost a lot of money. I, I don't think anybody saw this coming. I mean, some people pick Clemson to, to cover or win, but like to win by what was it 28 points something like that yeah there was talk about alabama being arguably the best college football team ever that obviously didn't play out that way but my goodness clemson wow that was that was as shocking of a college football championship game i can remember in a while to me when we were talking earlier about scheme being able to help beat a good team i look at early in that game where they Clemson on defense, especially. I mean, we, we can talk all the all day long about Trevor Lawrence and that offense and how explosive they were. Oh, don't worry. We'll be talking as long as we're on this podcast and the Broncos are in a quarterback figured out. I think we're going to be talking about him a lot. But <laughs> yes, uh, you're going to figure out very quickly, listeners, that that uh, Nick here kind of loves himself a little Trevor Lawrence. Well, kind of just a little. I have to get in line. I'm not the only one. I Some know, it's true. I mean, it's, it's pretty obvious the kind of talent that he has. But anyway, getting back to what they did on defense, I loved – I mean, they did a great job of showing man coverage, switching to zone. And it confused Tua, made him throw a couple early picks in that game, pick six, all those kind of things. And it was just genius. I mean, the, they just really did a great job 
setting up opportunities for big plays on defense. And it really got that game out of hand early, helped to not eliminate the run game for Alabama as they kept running it, but they they are a team that that they love to run the football. I mean, Alabama's always been known for running the football, and they have some great running backs there. They have a great offensive line, and they even averaged something like, what, seven yards a carry or something? Yeah, for that, that's right. And they ran well. They did. They did. But it just still forced Alabama to really have to – try to make some big plays happen when they just weren't there. I think the biggest surprise for me was Alabama's defense. I mean, we knew that the back seven wasn't as talented as it has been in years past. I mean, they replaced almost everybody last year, but Deontay Thompson, his playoff run tumble, he's tumbled down my board. And there's some talk that he may return. So I, I used to think, Hey, this guy may be a top 10 level pick. Mm-hmm. I did uh, not the case anymore. It's the tackling issues, some instincts issues. That's, I mean, He's probably the only cover one safety that I can get behind in this class, but top 10 hard pass. And then also, man, the, the Alabama defensive front for as good as they are, they don't have depth. And with the pace that Clemson played with and Alabama, not rotating guys in and out, you could really see that when that second half came in and Clemson, once they had that good drive, he scored the touchdown hands on the knees. I mean, you, they looked dead. And Quinn Williams was having himself a good game. Don't get me wrong. He was getting after the quarterback. But not having that depth, that rotation of guys that get after the quarterback and the speed that Clemson played at with the playmakers on the outside, I mean, it just it just wore them down. So, yeah, really exciting. Clemson's going to have to replace a lot of defensive talent. I just saw that Trey Lamar and Tavon Mullen just declared for the draft. So there's a potential, a couple potential first-round picks there. But the Clemson offense will be outside of Mitch Hyatt. I think everybody's returning. So <laughs> expect round five next year. That, that's unfair. <laughs> it's, I mean, why even play the college season? Let's just have them play three times next year just for the heck of it. Yeah. I mean, and, and a lot of those guys even were just freshmen this year for, for Clemson that were making plays in that game. So, I mean, they, they might be there for the next three years. Yeah. I mean, anytime you have Trevor Lawrence, you're going to be there. It's, but th- those guys were, they have such playmakers. Some of those catches that they made, I mean, Trevor Lawrence threw it where only his wide receiver could catch it, but his wide receiver actually caught it. That that was uh, some of the best wide receiver work I've watched all year. And it's crazy because when I've watched Clemson this year, they've had lapses in concentration at the wide receiver position. Yeah. They, they've had a lot more drops than I ever would have thought com- when you consider the talent. But, hey, when it's the national championship, I mean, everybody's tuned in, obviously. So I, I don't think that was an issue there. But you got to see some of, of that talent. And, and right there, you might have had, what, four or five wide receivers that are probably going to be first-round picks in that game? Oh, I mean, I think that both T. Higgins and Jerry Judy are better than any wide receiver in this class. And that Ross kid, that freshman for Tennessee, or for Clemson, oh, my God. He was incredible. So I, there was more talent there than. Did honestly, you listen to the broadcast on him? Uh, I don't remember. I think I had the TV kind of turned down low for that. Okay. Well, they were telling a story about when he was a freshman in high school, he wanted to quit football. Oh man. Thank God. He, uh, I guess he was so much better than all of his freshman classmates that they put him on varsity. And then he got really tired of playing with the upperclassmen because he wanted to just play with his friends. Mm. And his, I think his dad or mom, one of the two, and then his coach took him aside and said, you are not quitting. Yeah. You are too talented to quit this game. This game can take you places and this game is going to take him places. So uh, I'm sure now he's kind of going, thank you for not letting me quit. <laughs> yeah. All the way to the bank. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Some of the plays that those wide receivers were making was outstanding. I mean, like I said, Trevor Lawrence was, was outstanding as well, but his receivers helped him make turn a, a great game into a legendary game. Yeah. Again, I mean, Trevor Lawrence had some high variance throws. I mean, early on, he was kind of missing some dudes, but let's be real. That dude hung in the pocket. Quinn and Williams did get back there a few times, and he made a few throws that we haven't seen from the Broncos since, as far as arm talent goes, Jay Cutler was under center. I mean, that's, I don't think that's hyperbole. Pax and Lynch had that one good throw against Tampa Bay that we like to reminisce on, but other than that, it was all garbage. So pro- I'll go with the, probably the most talent, most talent from an arm perspective that Denver would have had since 
Pax, Pax, or, uh, Jay Cutler. So, you know, if this whole Fangio thing kind of blows up in the Broncos' face, it wouldn't be the worst to get in a position to get Trevor Lawrence. We'll, we'll just leave it at that. You know, we'll, we'll have a lot of debates about that going forward, I'm sure. You know, I'm not... I'm not a proponent of tanking, but I think in 2020, especially if Justin Fields is as talented as many people are making him out to be, there could be a lot of teams racing to get to the top of the draft. And if Denver doesn't have quarterback figured out, or if they, for some god awful reason, take Will Greer or Daniel Jones at the 10th overall pick, then yeah, that's we'll get into that more, listeners. But that's yeah. <laughs> god awful, all caps. <laughs> um, they then Denver will be in a position to maybe go after one of those guys. So we we will see. Oh man. Uh, speaking but, of quarterbacks, should we move on? Do you want to get into anything else with the, the national championship game? Oh, and also, last thing I want to say, I haven't been as high on him this season. I went back and watched the tape after Eric insisted that I do so. I don't know if I like him at top 10, but Christian Wilkins had himself an incredible game, and I am shocked by that because Alabama is very talented, and he was missing Dexter Lawrence next to him, and he was still getting after guys pretty consistently. I don't know if I'm taking him at 10, but if for some reason somebody wants to trade up and get an edge rusher that's there, and the Broncos trade down five, six, seven spots. I'm I'm on the Christian Wilkins train. Also, he, his personality is huge, which is great. Yeah, he uh, there. There was a couple double teams that he split the double team to make the play in the backfield. Yeah, that just had me having to rewind. Go, did that just happen? Yeah, it wasn't Quinn and Williams kind of talent, but it's it's that next level. And you put that again between Von Miller. Bradley Chubb, I think that guy could be very, very successful here in Denver. Yeah, very true. And I mean, he's just a good compliment to what they need. So, all right, well, we are already, you know, going a little bit long because obviously the Broncos are a lot of news as far as the coaching goes, but we are going to break down some of the offense today. And uh, where else to start? A quarterback. Broncos right now have two quarterbacks on the 53 One of them is Case Keenum, which this season, uh, would you call it a letdown, Carl? Oh, very much so. I'm I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Obviously. (laughs) Big letdown season. Even compared to, I I had tempered expectations. I mean, I didn't expect him to go out there and have what he did with the Vikings. Yeah. But I expected even more than what he gave us this year. Yeah. I mean, he kind of cleaned things up there second half of the season, but it's almost to the point where it was kind of weird. He had this, I'm over aggressive in the first half of the season. Then he had like this three or four game stretch where it was going, Oh man. Okay. This guy's figured out. Don't take some of those bigger chances, but yet at the same time, you still have to stay aggressive. And then end of the year, it was, I don't want to be aggressive at all because I'm so afraid of throwing an interception and ruining this game that I'm just not going to do anything. So it was kind of, we got, we got to see three different case Keenums throughout the season. And I, I just it it leaves me to the point where I'm not desperate for a new quarterback. I mean, because you don't want to reach on a guy. You already said it with Drew Lock or not Drew Lock with uh, um, Will Grier and Daniel Jones. There, there's some talk that they might find themselves in the top ten just because teams are so desperate for quarterback. But at the same time, I mean, it's kind of making me go, man. I I wouldn't mind trading up if it means we get a better quarterback than Case Keenum because he's just not going to take his places. And I guess I feel a little bit better with Case Keenum if if Kubiak is the court, the coach because, I mean, those two have worked together a lot, so they understand each other. He understands the strengths and weaknesses of Case Keenum, and I think he can put together a greater scheme than Munchak, or not our offense coordinator this year. Musgrave. Musgrave. Oh, my goodness. I have Munchak on the mind because he's been the guy that we've been talking about so much. But Musgrave, I, I think that Kubiak can do a better job with Case Keenum. So I expect a little bit better year. And I do ex- I do expect because of the hiring of Fangio and, of course, Kubiak being the offensive coordinator, I do expect Case Keenum's going to be a quarterback here on the Broncos next season because he loves himself some Case Keenum. Yeah. That's uh, that's very true. However, Keenum's deal sets up perfectly where you can take a guy that you don't have to go to year one and can transition to a quarterback. However, it's really not the year to go early on quarterback, I think, outside of Haskins. Eric will will be going back and forth all season. I do like a lot of what Drew Locke brings to the table as far as tools. Is he a top 10 level player? Ah, probably not in my book. Is he a first round grade from me? I would say so. The real question will be Kyler Murray. 
but yeah, no, I got <laughs> And that's, that's my guy. Is yeah, this kind of like last year where each of us had our own quarterback? I, I don't have a quarterback in this class. Don't, don't pin anybody on me this season. You said Haskins though would be oh, your well, top guy. I think Eric is with Haskins as well. Oh, is he? Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, I think so. I'm, I'm definitely not Jones. I'm not Greer. That's as far as I am right now. <laughs> I, I can get on board with that. I, I do think for me, Kyler Murray, there's just some exciting pieces to his game. Yeah. And I think he is only scratching the surface of what he could be as a quarterback. I don't disagree, but there is it's an unprecedented skill set, which makes me nervous. Obviously somebody's gotta be the first guy to do it, and the league has changed where you can't touch these quarterbacks as much. But he probably played behind the best offensive line in football this season. He had a lot of time to f- to throw it in a great scheme, and I just didn't see the the toucher anticipatory throws or processing speed that made Baker Mayfield great in that offense. So it was a different type of success. Is right. that tra- is that as translatable to the NFL? Probably not. But he's I, not going to go first overall. So I will ask you this though: I know that their offensive line was great, but how much did Kyler Murray help because of his feet, where teams couldn't just flat, flat out rush him? They had to kind of do the contain contain yeah that's yeah. the word i was looking for that's i mean chicken or the egg carl you, you can't we can't really know for sure because we didn't see it any other way we couldn't test him with a peyton manning back there you know so yeah I, I guess i look at when they played alabama the first quarter obviously was downright disgusting for for oklahoma yeah but it seemed like once he got used to how they were going to rush him how they were getting after him he started destroying that defense. Yeah. So I, I feel like even against great defenses that can get after him and, and not have complete perfect pocket to throw in, I think he can still go out there and have success in the NFL. That's, that's my personal opinion. I really love the guy. I've watched him all year. I mean, I live in big 12 country, you're big 10 country. And so I've been hearing about this guy all, all over the place. I have a lot of friends who are Oklahoma fans. And so they've been saying, Hey, you got to watch this kid. So like I said, I've watched a ton of his games and I just, I really like a lot of what he has. I think he has a really good foundation. And I think he's one of those guys, like I said, because he's had baseball in his life, he's never really fully committed to football. What would this guy look like if he fully committed to football? Yeah. I, I don't disagree. We should probably, stick somewhat to the roster here yes yes sorry <laughs> I, I get a little excited when we start talking about some other quarterback options than case keenum yeah but uh, the other guy that's kind of on the roster kind of not kevin hogan he's a restricted yeah. free agent for the broncos i mean he's a cheap option to have as a backup it really would not shock me for the broncos to go ahead and sign him to a restricted free agent offer i don't see any other teams offering anything for him i mean so uh, he's a He's the kind of backup I guess you want. He's not the guy you want out there starting, obviously, but he's not completely terrible where you just don't want him on your roster either. Yeah, I don't disagree. I think he's a solid arm, but is he a quarterback too? Like if the Broncos, like Case Keenum wasn't good this year, but if Case Keenum went down this team and you go Kevin Hogan this season, this team is probably a two-win team. That's, I think, the drop-off there is massive so they definitely need to bring some competition in for him next year and i think they will whether it be an early round quarterback or a mid-round quarterback there's there's gonna have to be some competition there right yeah, i how would you feel you know keeping it on quarterbacks here how would you feel if they did stick with keenum for next year you know keenum's still the quarterback um like i said i i feel better with kubiak at the helm yeah i i just I think there's some decent things that can happen with Case Keenum. I I don't think he'll ever quite have a a season like he did with the Vikings. That was a little bit fluky. But he can have a better year than this year. And I think if Fangio can improve that defense just a little bit, I think the Broncos can become a a tough team to beat. I I mean, they're going to always – if Case Keenum's at the helm, they're always going to lean on their run game. And, I mean, and that's what they should do. They got – a lot of good players with the run game, their offensive line sets up for the run game. It just makes a lot of sense that that be the focus of the offense. I I just, I'd be a little disappointed if there's at least not some kind of promising draft pick behind case Keenum. That at least gives me some hope that there might be a player on this team because case Keenum is not the future. I don't see case Keenum even getting a, a second contract here with the Broncos. 
yeah, no, I, do, I don't disagree. They'll probably have to go with something here. I think personally, if I were in charge, I would look for a a Case Keenum esque level quarterback, a guy that you maybe you can develop into a borderline starter, but a very competent backup that you can keep on cheap for four years. Maybe a, a Gardner Minshew and Easton Stick that you can develop and have some talent there, but. Yeah, I don't disagree. I don't see the Broncos, though, given Keenum's contract and the amount of dead money that'll be on there, you know, $10 million if they release him. I don't see that might be a candidate for a Nick Foles or a Joe Flacco or a Tyrod Taylor type. That said, if the Eagles keep winning and Carson Wentz is on the market, <laughs> wow. Okay, we should probably save that. The Eagles have to keep winning first, but that's yes. all right. Oh, that, that's, that's my all-time dream. Oh, my God. The three first-round picks. Some of them have to be conditional with the, the injuries, obviously, but I mean, wow. <laughs> we'll see. We we probably should move on to running backs here, though. Getting a little long, obviously. What's new? Welcome to the podcast. You're a first-time listener. We always run a little long. <laughs> but uh, running backs. Broncos got – you have four listed here. They got three, in essence, running backs on the active roster. They do have – oh, gosh, who's the running back? Jeremy McNichols. I want to say the name, the guy from Boise State, a few years ago on the practice squad. But they'll be bringing in some guys to compete. But really a young upside running back group here. Philip Lindsay, congratulations on him. The NFL paying for his way to the, the Pro Bowl, big for him. A great season. And with Broncos bringing in Kubiak, you know, the running game is still going to be a, a priority for this team. So that's good for him. Uh, Royce Freeman, a guy who kind of hit a wall down the stretch, had an injury, but cheap, you know, uh, less than uh, $1 million on the books. Uh, Devontae Booker, even cheaper, about 800000 on the books. And then Andy Janovich, he, you know, we talk about, is the fullback position dying? Is it not? Well, Kubiak's offense, let's hope it's evolved a little bit, but it still has some principles. Like we've seen with Kyle Shanahan, they paid big money for Kyle Juszczyk, kind of an all, all-around piece on that offense. So there's going to be a spot for Andy Janovich on this team. So running backs look good. I don't love this running back class in the draft. I wouldn't be upset if they brought in a very low level free agent to compete in camp, you know, the Steven Ridley kind of type, or they brought in obviously some undrafted free agents. But I think if there's any position on this team that is, I'm okay being quote unquote set going into next season, it's these four guys. Yep. I- I'm with you completely. I mean, uh, how do you argue? Philip Lindsay just had one of the best undrafted free agent rookie years ever. Yeah. And one of the most explosive running backs in all of football probably one of the biggest bargains in all of football when he's making less than $600,000 for a season. And then Royce Freeman, like you said, he hit a wall, but before that he was looking pretty good. And as a number two and a guy that can really show up, especially around the goal line and, and power through some guys get in for the end zone. I mean, that that's always a good thing to have Devonte Booker, just a good veteran. It looked like things were starting to click a little bit more this year. He's a good third down running back. who can catch, he can block, and so, again, when he's on the cheap, how do you argue with that? And Andy Janovich, now that Kubiak most likely is offensive coordinator, I think his position on the team is all but solidified. But, again, all these guys, I mean, you're, you're spending less than, what, $4 million on your running back position alone? They're cheap. They got a lot of, figurative, figuratively speaking, I mean, Booker and Freeman ran a lot and Lindsey ran a lot in college, but, like, they're cheap, they're young, they got miles on their legs what would you change here? I mean, maybe Nothing. if you want to get a more receiving guy in there, although I did a film article close to the end of the season, Devonte Booker, you know, people like to crap on him because he didn't end up being a running back one, but dude's a good receiver. Dude can make plays after the catch. Most of the time he's a pretty good blocker and he's super cheap. So like he's on this team folks, like quit it out. <laughs> right. And and I'd seen somebody make a argument for Le- Le'Veon Bell that the Broncos are going to try to pursue him this off season. Stupid. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry that the guy wants ridiculous money. And I don't think that, I mean, I think he's obviously better than what the Broncos have here, but so much better that he deserves to be paid 24, 25 times as much as what these guys are making. At least what Philip Lindsay's making. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> Not worth spending your money there. I'd rather spend it on the offensive line and give these guys a better offensive line in front of them. For sure. I I don't disagree. I think that's one position that we are fine with. And then, you know, if let's say the Broncos kind of want to go with somebody, 2020, the draft class next year and the year after that look much more talented. So, again, I'm not a promoter of taking running backs early anyways. That's something I can really get behind with Kubiak. <laughs> so, yeah, no, it's a good scheme, however, or a good uh, group there. Wide receiver, though, 
much more interesting, much, much more interesting. Emmanuel Sanders, it's got to start with him. He has a contract for almost $13 million next year and a dead money hit of two and a half or $2.7 million and $10.3 million if they savings if they release him. And apparently it's an option. Actually, they could decline the option, not actually an outright release. So that means that there's probably not an injury clause in there. Don't I don't have his contract directly in front of me, so don't quote me on that. I have to go with what's on the internet. But Sanders is going to be interesting. The Achilles injury, being over 30 years old, I've heard from some people that he's probably out. However, a guy like Ben Albright, who's about as connected as anybody as there is in the Denver media and in the NFL, is saying that, you know, don't be so sure of that. So we will see Emmanuel Sanders. If he can come back healthy, he's a perfect complement to everything they have on this team. I mean, he really is. But over 30 years old, one year left on the contract, and the Achilles injury as late in the season as it had, as it happened, excuse me, I just, I don't know, Carl. I, I don't know. Yeah, I'm with you. I mean, when you could probably go spend that $10.3 million on a pretty good veteran to bring in that can play the entire season compared to Sanders, who, what, at best is going to be back by week seven or eight, right? That, that'd be best case scenario with an Achilles injury. There's some talk that some people have said maybe he could be back week one. There's some talk he could miss the entire season. I think it's too early in the process to know, which is honestly the main concerning thing for me. I'd feel better if I actually knew he was going to be back week seven rather than the uncertainty. Yeah. I mean, and and that'll probably play into it. The Broncos can keep him on the roster until closer to the season anyway, if if they need to, and just kind of see what his development is. I mean, and, and again, free agency doesn't kick off until March. So they got a few months here to really, again, just see what happens with his rehab, see how close he's getting, how far away he is, whatever, however you want to view it. I I just, if he's not ready by at least mid-season to be in actual game-ready condition, I just can't keep him at that kind of money. I mean, you got other positions that need filled right now. This is a team that needs an influx of talent added to it. And that $10 million, that could be a huge help. That could be, uh, I mean, again, you just wrote an article on Landon Collins. That could maybe be Landon Collins right there. Yeah, perhaps. So I, I don't know. I, I'm i torn, but I want a veteran as well on this team. Because then you have Cortland Sutton, Deshaun Hamilton. Andre Holmes is a veteran, but not a great veteran. And then River Craycraft, Jordan Taylor, Tim Patrick. I mean, and, and I like these guys. I mean, this is a this is a good young group. Tim Patrick was making plays there at the end of the season that make you believe this is a guy that can be a be on the roster and be a quality player on the roster. But he's not elite. He's not starter quality, in my opinion. Deshaun Hamilton, he's a better slot receiver than he is full time starter. Cortland Sutton, he's got about as much upside as anybody out there. But again, upside means something you haven't done yet. Is he that quality, consistent guy that you can depend on to be your your go-to guy when you absolutely need to play? Or is he just going to be that deep threat, throw it up, let him go catch it kind of guy? That's that's what the Broncos need to figure out with him moving forward. So uh, I don't know. It, it's again, I need, a, I need a veteran with this group. Yeah. Because Emmanuel Sanders, again, he was that guy that's when Case Keenum needed to throw to somebody – Emmanuel Sanders was the guy like Cortland Sutton was the nice guy to target about four or five times a game that he could have that big play maybe twice a game. But Emmanuel Sanders was that first down machine, third down play third down and five. I'm throwing it to Emmanuel Sanders and the Broncos don't have that guy on the roster right now. Yeah, I don't disagree. Depending on Sanders injury, we'll know more about that as time comes on, but I, they, I don't know. We'll see. I think there are a few wide receivers in the free agent market that might be interesting, but free agent market for wide receiver has kind of gotten bananas. I mean, hasn't it? What what did uh, Quincy and Nunwa just get paid? Because Sammy Watkins last year. It makes me really concerned about what a guy like Golden Tate could go for on the market, or even John Brown, who are two guys that I kind of have penciled, because looking at this wide receiver group, they need speed badly. They really need speed. And- so. And we'll I'm, I'm a wide receiver guy, but I don't understand why wide receivers are making this kind of money because they are such a dependent position on having a good quarterback. <laughs> yeah, it's I mean, they're not as 
they're not as easy to find a, of a good wide receiver as that of running back, but they're still, I mean, you can find guys in that fourth, fifth round of the draft that can come in and be really quality starters. I'm really suffering with names today. Stefan Diggs. Stefan Diggs. Adam Thielen. Yeah. yeah, all those kind of guys are top quality, top 15 kind of wide receivers in the NFL right now, and they weren't first round picks. Yeah, but that's true for a lot of positions. That's true. Yeah, so I agree it's a dependent position, but I think the league is kind of becoming more and more like college with this power spread. And if you got playmakers on the outside, that changes everything. So, I mean, look at the difference between the Broncos offense when they had Sanders to when they didn't have Sanders. It, I mean, it was, it really was night and day. It really made me appreciate his value and impact on the team more than I have probably ever. So we'll see. It's going to be interesting, but the biggest, biggest thing that's putting it on a hiatus or like a wait and see is Emmanuel Sanders. Is he back next year? If not, that changes everything. I do like the depth in this draft class. As far as wide receiver goes, I don't think there is a guy that is, I would feel great about taking in the top 10. You know, there isn't a, a true Julio Jones, AJ green level talent. In my opinion, now DK Metcalf's a very interesting guy, but there's a, not huge issues with his uh, production, a little bit raw. Ole, Ole Miss literally had a play that was called get open, so there's no route running there. But, uh, yeah, it's uh, it'll be interesting, but I'm, I wouldn't feel comfortable taking any in the top 10 in this class. Like we talked about in the championship game uh, recap, There's I think there's much more top talent next year at the wide receiver position, especially that guy from Colorado as well. So I'm sure the listeners already know about that kid, at least most of them. But yeah, no, it'll be interesting. They definitely, they definitely need to touch the wide receiver market here. And Andre Holmes, you know, sayonara probably. Jordan Taylor, I know he's got beautiful long hair, but who cares really? He, he's a nine route guy with very little nuance. Main guys there that I'm looking at are Sutton and Hamilton. And after that, you got to kind of build around. Him. Oh, and Tim Patrick. After that, you got to kind of build around him. But talking about a position that really just has no prospects <laughs> going forward is the the tight end position. Jeff Hireman, off injured, talented, but off injured, very erratic play. I think he was in line for probably one of the best years of his career before getting injured. And I wouldn't be upset if they brought him back, especially now that Kubiak is going to be the offensive coordinator play caller. Hireman is a Kubiak guy. He was in Kubiak's first draft class as a third round pick. So I wouldn't be surprised if the Broncos made an offer for Hireman. Is he going to be a team's tight end one? He's very low end tight end one if you're looking for that. But I think he could be a good tight end, too, and I've been very impressed with his blocking progression as the years have gone on. Brian Parker, exclusive rights free agent. They might keep him. I could see him keeping Matt Lacoste and Brian Parker exclusive right free agents, but, you know, they're, they're camp bodies. You know, we saw we saw the massive talent drop off. Those, those guys are the dime a dozen types of talents, unfortunately. Uh, Jake Butt injured again. We'll see about that. And then Troy Fumagalli coming back. I, uh, skeptical about his talent level. I think he can be a solid receiver, but... He's not an uh, earth-shattering talent by any means. So luckily for the Broncos, even if they bring Hireman back and Butts healthy, I think they're going to look at tight end early, and especially with Kubiak's offense as well. Tight end's pretty pretty important for that offense, and this is a good tight end draft class. So I'm expecting them to use a second through fifth round pick, not all of them, but one of those picks on a tight end this season. (laughs) And it's a good tight end class. I don't think there's going to be three first round picks like we saw back two seasons ago. But I would be surprised, or I wouldn't be surprised if eight to twelve guys went rounds two through five. I, I keep imagining running the the two tight end set with Jeff Hireman and then T.J. Hawkinson on the other side, e, and fine. teams having no clue if they're running the football, passing the football. Uh, that that would be my dream, and and I think that is a little bit when we're looking at the wide receiver position if the Broncos decide to go very tight end early and say, bring back Jeff Hireman, then maybe having that really, really strong third and fourth wide receiver, are not as big a deal because we're going to be running a lot more two tight end sets, which actually goes very much against what the NFL is about today. And, and maybe could help the Broncos where teams are not used to playing teams that want to run out of that kind of package. Uh, mm-hmm. So I, I don't know. It'll be interesting to see what they do. Like you said, this is a very loaded tight end group. And very excited to see who the Broncos decide to bring in. And I, I really do think a TJ Hawkinson could be a, a Kubiak kind of guy because he likes those guys that can block and get out there and, and be a receiving option. I can't disagree, but it'll be interesting to see this tight end class. We'll get more into it with the draft, but this is a as deep and talented tight end class as I can remember in a while. 
But now outside of quarterback, everybody's favorite scapegoat, the offensive line. And there's going to be a lot of changes here this season. You know, we had Elijah Wilkins. We'll start at the bottom. This time we'll switch it around. Elijah Wilkinson, solid right guard. You know, he has some versatility. He's going to be an exclusive rights free agent. He will be back next year. I have zero doubt about that. Is he a quality starter? No, he struggled. He was probably the worst player on the offensive line once he was asked to come in. But he's a depth piece. So and a cheap depth piece, depth piece at that. So interesting to see him there. I'm really excited to see Sam Jones progress next year. There's a lot of excitement about him going forward. And with Kubiak coming in, are they going to switch to more to zone? I mean, you still got Kukler there who's been more power. It'll be interesting to see how that mesh goes. But Sam Jones is a guy that some people are pretty excited about as a development player. And then you got Connor McGovern still on contract. He was worse in center than I thought he'd be this season. I'd hoped he'd kind of be an option to give the Broncos some flexibility at center going forward with Paradis about to, uh, Paradis set to hit free agency, but that didn't work and made me really value Paradis. Once again, you know, grass isn't always green on the other side, but he played pretty well at right guard, except when he was isolated against really dominant interior pass rushers with length. That was his, his issue. And it's probably going to continue to be an issue, but you know, he's coming up on, will it be his fourth year or third year? This will be his fourth year. It'll be his fourth year. So last year of his contract. So it'll be interesting to follow him there. But I think he did enough at right guard that you don't look to replace him unless an obvious you know, talent falls right into your lap. That's kind of the thing. And then Garrett Bowles, I think he's second at left tackle again this year. He was more up than down this season. Still high variance, but he's a guy who's still growing. And I, I'm i going to go to bat for him still. I think that there's still a, ch- a chance there for left tackle. And there's not a single tackle in this class that I think is – an obvious enough talent that displaces him or a guy that's, you know, this guy has to play left tackle and then you displace Gary Bulls. There's some offensive line talent at the top of the draft, but I think those guys are better right tackles slash guards. So we'll see. Those guys are getting more valuable, obviously. So I have to change that philosophy a little bit. Ronald Leary is the one who's going to be interesting. 9.2 million cap hit, 2.4 million dead money. It, but the injury changes everything. He's been, he's finished the last two seasons on the IR. So the Broncos might be stuck with him with the contract. We'll see. We'll hear more about that as we get forward. But he's one I would like to move on from if we could. But I don't know if it's possible. And then free agency, you got some questionable guys. Gino Grabkowski, you know, good luck wherever you end up. Max Garcia, he actually played better this year than I thought he would. But odds are, like another guy, you know, sayonara, good luck wherever you go. The real questions are Billy Turner, Matt Paradis, and Jared Veldier. And I'm curious about your opinion on those three. Well, again, with Kubiak coming back, I think Matt Paradis is all but guaranteed to be the top free agent the Broncos want to bring back. Yeah, I thought that before Kubiak was going to be the offense coordinator, but now with him being there, that zone scheme, Paradis is just built for that. Yeah, And, I mean, again, you, you said it. Connor McGovern, we kind of thought maybe this guy can come in and really show that we don't need to spend that kind of money. He made it very obvious we need Paradis back. So I, I think he'll be back. Billy Turner – I, I think the Broncos are going to probably try pretty hard to bring him back too. I thought he did pretty decent, but it's again, that versatility of being able to play tackle, being able to play guard can kind of plug and play wherever you need him. And I thought he did. Okay. It wasn't great, but it was better than Wilkinson. Like you said, and especially if we're going to lose Leary, I don't think you can lose Turner as well. Yeah. And Valdir, that's the big one. It's so dependent upon, the kind of contract that he can get on the free agent market because he had a pretty good year. It wasn't anything outstanding. It wasn't earth shattering or anything like that. But again, compared to the right tackle position, the Broncos have had, (laughs) it was night and day. And so if they can bring him back on a decent contract, it wouldn't shock me to see them go ahead and try to bring him back. But I think he could probably price himself out of Denver. It's very possible. I'm definitely on the same ilk as you though i think you need to bring back paradis and honestly i'm probably gonna write an article about this as my next article but i think they should bring back billy turner reasons being a he's young b he's shown improvement down the stretch and c which i think is big this is a big one his positional versatility i think he gives not only positional versatility from a game to game because you're going to have injuries along the offensive line that's just going to happen but he gives you positional versatility in the draft. I think, you know, potentially if you can, you can sign him and say, Hey, you're going to be right tackle. And then if a guy falls to you, maybe Jonah Williams, yeah, could use Cody Ford that you like a right tackle more. I'm fine making him be the sixth offensive lineman. You know, they're going to find a use for him to start at some point with that. And he can push, you know, Leary or McGovern at guard, but it just, that, that positional versatility I think is huge. And I don't think he's going to cost as much. 
So I, I am a big proponent of bringing back uh, Billy Turner, honestly. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. Like I said, I, I thought that versatility was a big part of his game that he brings. And, and I think he's been he's been one of those guys because he played so terrible at the beginning of his career. So many people still view him in that light. But like you said, I think he really was underrated in how well he was playing down the stretch. It wasn't anything, like I said, it wasn't anything great, but it was for a guy that could come in and, and start a few games or say Leary goes down with injury again and you need to plug this guy in. It's not all of a sudden your offensive line is completely destroyed. And that's something you need out of that sixth guy that can come and start four different positions for you. Yeah. Yeah, I do not, uh, I do not disagree at all. All right, Carl. Well, we are, again, running long. It's going to take a little bit to edit today. Luckily, I get to edit this a little earlier, but divisional preview. I'm just going to go play-by-play or game-by-game, I guess, here, and I'm curious about your picks and why, and I'll give my sense too. But I'm going to start from the bottom here because I think the top game you have listed is the most interesting one. It'll be the first game, but we'll start with the the late game, the 3 o'clock game on Sunday, which is interesting in itself. Philly versus New Orleans. I have New Orleans winning that one. Home game for them. As lucky and as good as Philly has been, I think New Orleans just has too much talent. I cannot wait to watch this Philadelphia defensive front, which is arguably the best in football this season. You know, they, I don't know how they get underrated every single year, but they really are. That defensive front, I mean, Fletcher Cox and Brandon Graham might be the best defensive tackle slash edge rush duo in the NFL, and they're playing like it right now. I mean, the Bears offensive line has been pretty good this year, and they gave them fit after fit versus the New Orleans offensive line, which for my money is the best in football. They're healthy again. Tron Armstead's healthy. They got Max Unger. They got Adrias Pete. They got Warford who can move space. And then they got Ryan Ramchek at the right tackle. I mean, that's it's the best offensive line in football, and it's making Drew Brees. Drew Brees is having an MVP caliber year, but it's the boys up front, I think, that really deserve the MVP for this team. So I'm really interested. I think New Orleans will win. However, I'm pulling for Philly because with every Philly win, a little bit more chaos <laughs> as far as Carson Wentz versus Nick Foles. Right. And, oh, I, I'm with you. I, I think a Philly win is better for the Broncos. Yeah. I mean, it, it keeps that dream alive just a little bit longer, though. Maybe Carson Wentz could be on his way out. I saw uh, Benjamin Albright tweeting about that today of when Tom Brady started playing so well. They had He had Drew Bledsoe in front of him, and he was one of those top picks. And so then all of a sudden, Tom Brady's playing so well. How can you keep him or how can you let Tom Brady go and keep Drew Bledsoe? And so they traded Drew Bledsoe. And so it wouldn't shock me if they sit there and say, well, teams are calling saying, hey, we'll offer you two first round picks for this kid. Man, how do you turn that down as Philly when Nick Foles is working so well in that system? I mean, if Philly goes back to the NFC Championship or even, you know, the, the Super Bowl. Gosh, that's it's just chaos. I'm not I'm not trading for Nick Foles. I think he's a perfect quarterback for their system, but I don't think yeah. you're not bringing the system with him. Yeah. But <laughs> Carson Wentz for a team that really values draft picks. Uh, that's that's a discussion for later. Maybe if Philly wins, we'll open that up, but I think New Orleans is going to win. Uh, the next game, the other Sunday game, that's going to be very interesting, the Los Angeles Chargers versus the New England Patriots. I'll start first here. I think the Patriots are going to win. Oh, and my, my preseason Super Bowl pick was the Saints versus the S- Patriots with the Saints winning, so that's still on the line for me as well to look, make me look like a genius. So we'll see. Uh, but the, the Chargers, this is actually my preseason AFC championship pick was the Chargers versus the Patriots. I think the Patriots are going to win. The, the weather is going to be bad. And that's, I mean, Philip Rivers' arm has started to look a little bit worse and worse. They, their defense is very talented. I mean, Derwin James, he's still my defensive rookie of the year. And they got amazing pass rush and solid offensive line weapons around them. You know, that's, that's a big thing. But I just can't imagine the Patriots losing this game with Bill Belichick having a week to prepare and the an extra week to prepare, excuse me. You know, the Patriots weather being is what it is. So I think the Patriots end up winning this game. Yeah, I mean, anytime you give Bill Belichick an extra week, and we've seen what they've been in the AFC championship six or seven years in a row. Good God, that's just horrible. <laughs> so I mean, this is a game that they are very primed at winning and doing well at and it's hard to pick against them right now. So I'm with you. I'll go New England in that one. All right. And then it's the Dallas Cowboys versus the Los Angeles Rams. And I'm gonna, this is my upset of the week. I think the Cowboys are going to upset them. I think that the Rams have not looked incredible on the back end, especially on defense. They got Aaron Donald, but the rest of that defense has not been great. And I think that the Cowboys, they're going to make the Rams earn it. 
And are the Rams going to be patient enough to march it down the field? I mean, this has been an explosive offense throwing it down the field, but Cowboys have been playing great defense. They got Byron Jones, who's been playing. I mean, he's, I think he's first or second team all pro cornerback this year. He's second team. You got good pass rushers on there. I mean, the, you got DeMarcus Lawrence, who's the edge rusher for them, who just, I mean, he's going to get paid this off season. Oh my God. Oh, whatever you want. Oh, blank check, man. He's going to get paid. <laughs> And then they got those linebackers that are just flying around. So I, I think Dallas is going to win this one. That's my upset of the week. Yeah. It, it wouldn't surprise me to see the Broncos uh, go after Sean Lee because he's kind of become an afterthought there. You think in he has Dallas. Seat? I, I, nah, I mean, it, it wouldn't be my favorite signing if they decide to go that way, but it could be one of those risk reward. Hey, this guy at one point was a top level off ball linebacker. Yeah. So we'll, we'll kind of see, but no, I'm, I'm still going to go the Rams in this one okay. just because I love their offensive line. Yeah. I think that they can give Dallas some trouble there with their front seven. And I think the Rams can actually run the football <sighs> defensively. I mean, they, they're set up defensively to do well to stop the run against Dallas. Their, their strength on defense lines up with the strength on Dallas's off offense. <sighs> I don't know, it's going to be a close one. That's my toss up game for sure. I'm not sure who's going to come out of victory on that one, but I'll go the Rams just to be different than you. Okay. All right. And then the Colts versus the chiefs. This will be an upset by Vegas, but I think the Colts are one of the hottest teams in football. They're playing very good football. And I don't think there's a quarterback that scares me more than football in football right now than Andrew Luck. I mean, his game against the Texans granted, you know, they kind of took the foot off the gas in the second half, but man, he is playing best football of his career right now. And that defense is playing very disciplined. I just don't think – I think the Chiefs are too weak on defense to to keep up in this game. I think Andrew Luck is going to be able to kill them slowly, methodically. And, you know, they don't even have great weapons there. But you got Eric Ebron and T.Y. Hilton. I think that's enough there. And with Andrew Luck, I think he's – Patrick Mahomes won the MVP this year, but I don't think he's the best quarterback in football right now. I think the best quarterback in football right now is Andrew Luck. So I'm going with the Colts. So funny thing, I, I live in Chiefs country, obviously. And it has been funny to listen to Chiefs fans panic all week. They are so freaked out that they're going to be one and done in the playoffs once again under Andy Reid. And I've even had some of them tell me that they think it's time for Andy Reid to leave because of his lack of success in the playoffs. And uh, now this is a home game for the Chiefs. I know that hasn't meant much in the playoffs lately, but it's still a great home field advantage. I'm with you, though, that Andy or Andy Indy has the the pieces in place. They have a pretty good run game. The offensive line is just doing outstanding, which can shut down that that Chiefs pass rush that's actually been very good, that's helped out that not great secondary. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, if, if Andrew Luck can sit back there and just pick apart that secondary, I mean, it just I, – I really think Indy is going to win that one. Like First, you said, there's just no – there's no hotter team in football right now. I mean, what are they, 9-1 and one in their last 10 games? Yeah, they're hot. <laughs> maybe Philly. That's the only one I could say maybe. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. They got, but... they got the swag too. But, yeah, no, I would not want to play the Colts right now. You got the, probably an offensive line. Everything's clicking. It's, it's a team that's so young they don't know that they probably shouldn't be there. You know, it's one of those things, which I think the Chiefs, you know, it's not about being the best team over the season. It's about the team that's hot at the right time, and the Colts are hot. So it'll be a good game. So you're taking the Colts as well. I am. I am. I, I think something else that's very underrated is the the Colts have the linebackers to actually keep up with uh, Travis Kelsey mm-hmm. and and shut him down. They have safeties that are playing really well right now as well. And the Chiefs just haven't had much of a run game since they, they lost their running back to, well, just being kicked out of the NFL for right now. So I, I do. I think that Indy defense can slow down the Chiefs enough. I mean, you're never going to completely contain them. They're going to still have their big plays here and there. But I think that Indy offense, I just, that the Chiefs defense just is so terrible. And I heard somebody say it earlier this week your strengths get you into the playoffs, your weaknesses knock you out of the playoffs. And we saw that last week with the, the Bears. Their weakness was their, their kicking game. I mean, their, their field goal kicker had missed 10 field goals this season. I think they'd already lost like two or three games this season because their field goal kicker missed uh, field goals at the end of the game. 
And I'm not trying to say, hey, everything should be on the field goal kicker because it was blocked there at the end a little bit. It was tipped. But again, that was a weakness and it showed up there at the end of the game. And for the Chiefs, it's been that that defense. If they don't have a great pass rusher that can get through, which again, with the Colts having a great offensive line right now, they have inside guys that can actually shut down your boy, Chris Jones. My boy. And, <laughs> your boy. <laughs> Uh, but I mean, and, and that's going to be the matchup of the week. I know everybody's excited about Andrew Luck versus Mahomes, but to me, it's Chris Jones uh, versus Quentin Nelson. Oh my goodness. that That's the matchup I'm going to watch. I don't care where the football goes. I'm just going to keep an eye on those guys. And just to be able to see Quentin Nelson pancake Chris Jones, that's going to be fun for me. Okay. And I, as good as Quentin Nelson's been, Zach Martin's been playing great football down the stretch as well. And also, let's give a shout out to Costanzo, solidifying, staying healthy. Ryan Kelly playing center at the highest level. I mean, he's arguably a top three center in football right now. And Braden Smith, a guy who played guard for Auburn, solidifying right tackle. I mean, I didn't even scout him that way. I, I'm, I feel stupid for doing that. I mean, how many guys go guard to tackle? I don't think, I can't even think of that <laughs> happening. So, gosh, that's a, we didn't even have a chance to do it in the second round. But like, man, smacking myself in the head for that one. All right, well, that's going to wrap up this week's episode of Building the Broncos. You can find Carl on Twitter, at Carl Dummler MHH, and, Nick, and myself, at Nick Kendall MHH. Also, make sure you head over to Mile High Huddle, an affiliate of 24-7 Sports and CBS Sports Digital, to find ours and our co-writers' articles and all things pertaining to your Denver Broncos. Head on over to iTunes and leave us a five-star rating and comment. Your support can help us continue to bring you our Denver Bronco deep dives. You aren't just here to bring you the news, but an in-depth analysis each week from team building, game planning, and 365 days of covering the Denver Broncos. You can follow the Building the Broncos podcast and all our other great audio content by subscribing to the Huddle Up podcast on iTunes and for Android users, Stitcher, as well as check us out on YouTube. You can follow us on Twitter at Mile High Huddle and at BTB Football Pod. Again, please be sure to subscribe and rate us and reach out to us on Twitter or Facebook or anything as we really love interacting with you fellow Bronco fans. For Carl Dumbler, I'm Nick Kendall wrapping up another episode of the Building the Broncos podcast. What an eventful week. It's just getting started here. We hope you enjoyed it, and we will see you once again next week. Go Fangio, go Kubiak, go Elway, go Broncos. You've been listening to Building the Broncos. Join Broncos Country's deep divers at milehighhuddle.com to keep the conversation going. 